I get asked all the time about these viral videos that Christians love to share that talk all about Hebrew. Everything mm-hmm. from every time you breathe, you're saying the name Yahweh to the whole gospel is contained in the letters of Bereshith in Genesis. And, and it really means God will live in the tent of man and something, something, something. And they're usually TikTok videos. They're usually YouTube videos. They're quick. They're pithy. They're memorable. And they're just not true. At least everything I know about biblical scholarship, they're not true. The idea of the folded napkin and that being the tradition that the the host is going to come back to the table. And so Jesus leaving the folded shroud at the tomb was every Jewish person would know it's him saying he's coming back. These stories circulate and Christians share them because we want to believe them. Because yeah. anything in the Hebrew is automatically more esoteric and cool and authentic and this and that. But most of the time, they're just nonsense. And yeah. so how do you encourage people to not get sucked right. in by other than, hey, verify something before you share it on social media? But we can't always do that immediately. So just a right. general rule of thumb, how do we know when something is probably not accurate that's being presented yeah. to Christians? Yeah, if it's being shared on TikTok, um <laughs> I would say, assume that it's not true. Um, <laughs> Good rule. So, because generally TikTok is not the uh, vehicle for disseminating truth in biblical studies. I'm going to be very measured in my. <laughs> very comments. diplomatic, but I agree. Yes. yes. But yes. what I what I would say in terms of some practical advice is. For those who are genuinely interested in finding out more about these significant cultural issues, there, there's a two-volume set by InterVarsity Press. Um, I, I always get these titles confused. They all run together. But the, the Bible background commentary of the New Testament, I think it is, mm-hmm. and the Bible background commentary of the Old Testament. Put together IVP, by, Bible background commentary. The, yeah, there it is. Thank you. These <laughs> titles all just get jumped. They, I, I, um the they're fantastic works. And now just because something doesn't appear in there doesn't mean it's not true. But I think by using those really concise and very affordable tools, Mm -hmm. it will help one to develop a sense of whether something makes sense or is worth investigation when you hear it online. Mm -hmm. And, And furthermore, it's a reliable way to find out about the cool types of things that you're already interested in. So I would say, forget about TikTok, switch over to the IVP Bible background commentary series, and you'll be very glad you did. It's more profitable. Yeah, that's great advice. I heartily agree. I definitely recommend those. The New Testament one is by Craig Keener as the editor, and John Walton edited the Old Testament volume. Is this a fair thing to say? I think my own understanding is that much of what gets read into the Jewish background of Jesus type presentations, not all, but much of it actually comes from, I think, either the Mishnah or, or something later than the first century. Um I may be yeah, so, that, but so a lot of these practices of like, oh, every Hebrew boy would know X, Y, Z. When you look at the source, it's it's a it's a second or third century or later Jewish source rather yeah. than first century Galilee. Is that am I in the right ballpark? That's a tricky one to answer because, like the works that I've uh, the work that I've done with the Targums, the you know the Aramaic Bible, um, the what we essentially call the Aramaic Targumim today, are all appear to be written at least in their current forms. They're they're redacted into their current forms after the time of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But there is little doubt that some of the traditions that are in there surely date back to the time of Jesus. And so the, the question about can you use a later source to determine something that was going on in the time of Jesus is not an easy one. And you have to really be ready to roll up your sleeves and, and, um, you know, do a lot of investigative work on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the end of the day, there, a lot of times there is not going to be proof. What you're going to get is 
uh, you know, pieces of evidence of various shades of reliability. Mm -hmm. And and that's because in scholarship, we don't deal with proof anyway. We deal with evidence, Mm -hmm. convincing evidence, moderately convincing evidence, eh, not so convincing evidence. But we don't deal with proof because there are no video cameras and, you know, that sort of thing. And so there's always going to be room for discussion. I would say really the best source that I'm aware of, uh, in addition to the IVP Bible background commentary, um, I, I don't, I haven't used the, the New Testament volume a lot lately. So I, I know Keener draws a lot from Jewish tradition. So I assume there's a lot of that in there. But the Jewish Study Bible, or I'm sorry, the uh, the Jewish Annotated New Testament, Okay. which is done by Jewish scholars, and it's a very competent work. Christians who are not familiar with, with Jewish, uh, you know, sacred sources like the, the Talmud and the Mishnah and, and the Targumim and all that will probably need some guidance to use it most effectively. But it still, to my knowledge, is the best source. And I would say, if you're interested in this kind of thing, go and consult that those two volumes first, and then you'll probably be on solid footing. To me, I think it's helpful for our viewers because it shows that when you see these teachings that are presented so winsomely and so convincingly, and they and they state things as if they're absolutely true, that's when I think a healthy skepticism should pop up, right. especially right. if it's something that makes so much sense that we want to believe. I think yeah. it's, we should be like, that's very interesting. Let me go check on that. Right. Uh, because it doesn't mean you reject it. You know, we don't want to be naturally suspicious of everything and just, oh, I'm not going to believe it unless you... Right. The, you know, okay. whenever people tell me, especially I have friends that are kind of all over the spectrum and some in the more charismatic uh, and some in, in, in the more like Hebrew roots cultures... And whenever I, they'll, somebody will share something and it's really exciting and they're like, oh, I've, I've done my research and this means this and this. And it's something sometimes that I actually know is not true. I don't ever want to be like, no, you're dumb. That's not, you know, I always want to encourage the enthusiasm, <laughs> but yeah. temper the, uh, you know, just to show the limitations to say, listen, right. th- it's not like it's impossible, but it's certainly not definitive. And, and so... Yeah. Being able to hold we things in with loose hands. Probability and plausibility, and but um, yeah. very often not definitiveness, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So then on that note, what about the Bible codes? You said there's no letter certainty, but if you feed the letters of the Hebrew Bible into a supercomputer, you can predict 9-11, you can predict the stock market, you can predict all this stuff because I watched the documentary yeah. on the History Channel and it's pretty compelling. So. And I'm sure the dates of my birth and death and all of that are in there too. So, <laughs> I, sorry, I shouldn't be snarky, but uh, no. The, <laughs> from, from the Bible academic... codes, you're allowed to be snarky. I think. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Tell me, well, tell me why. Yeah. Tell me why you so, would not put much stock in the Bible codes. Yeah, and so for those who have stuck around this long and have tolerated <laughs> the arcane discussion about uh, my my dissertation work and the subloco notes. Um, one of the things that those subloco notes deal with, in part, has to do with the presence and absence of optional letters in Hebrew words. So the example I give in my book, Jesus's Bible, is, uh, you know, the first town I lived in was Foxborough, Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, if you watch a Patriots game these days, I think when they spell out Foxborough, it's F-O-X-B-O-R-O. But if you go to the common or you know, what is the town green uh, in Foxborough, big sign up around the common, which spells it with its longer spelling ending in O-U-G-H. They're both legitimate spellings. Many words in Hebrew Bible had optional ways of spelling them. And spelling conventions changed over the course of the centuries too. And that's you know, uh, just observable in manuscripts that we have today. They disagree on how to spell words. So if that's the case and every letter matters, well, which manuscript are you using? There is no one letter perfect edition of the Bible. And when when people talk about Bible code, the first question you ask is, which text of the Bible are you using? 
Yeah. For those who just don't know anything about Bible codes, it's, it's not even getting into it, but you basically, somebody feeds a massive amount of data into a computer, a text, and then based on where the letters are in relation to each other in a grid, when you lay them out, you can see where it's like a big word search and you can find words that supposedly have meaning and, and it's, it, it doesn't work if the text is one letter off. If you move it one letter one way or the other, the whole thing breaks down. So right. the Bible codes is it's just it's modern day Gnosticism. Um, it it appeals to this esoteric, deeper, hidden meaning that is only able to be found by computers. And it's just I have even less taste for it than you. I will be even more blunt than you. <laughs> it's garbage. It's nonsense. Don't pay one whit of attention to it. Uh, that's my own thing. That's not Christopher Doss' uh, words. Those are mine. Yep.